that's what we need to have. So I need you to be thinking today about how you're going to fit into that system and, wh and what issue you're going to take up and which district you're going to take charge of chasing your member of Congress until they follow the peace agenda. Massachusetts is a liberal state. Not everybody in Massachusetts is liberal, but a lot of people are. And our delegation is all Democrat, as you well know. And we have the basis to make them leaders for peace. Some of them are already, others not so much. So we have work to do, but we have the potential to make our delegation into a truly leading delegation for peace, and that in turn is gonna to help to move the whole country. On the state front, it's much the same. We've, this year, our, our uh, meeting in January approved our peace and justice, Commonwealth Peace and Justice Agenda, which is a list of nine bills that raise a variety of peace issues in Beacon Hill, not just in Washington. Now we have bills in Beacon Hill as well. And just like we do in Congress, we need to go after every different legislator about those bills particularly the ones that are on the committees. Our bills are, I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself, we'll talk later about the state bills. But we have, our bills are assigned to four different panels, or uh, joint committees in, in the state legislature, and we are going, we have to go see all those chair people. One of them is from Haverhill, one of them is from, where are they from? One is from Taunton or Bridgewater, so forth and so on, right? So we need people in all the towns of Massachusetts to do the thing and chase their legislators to get those bills a good hearing. And this, then when it comes to the rank and file committee members, we'll have hearings this summer and fall on all of our nine bills. And then uh, assuming we get a favorable report out of the committees, we're actually going to go to every legislator, 200 people, and talk to them about voting for our bills. Okay? That's a lot of work. But it's a good thing because it gives a task for every single person in Massachusetts to do that agrees with peace. If, you're, if the issues seem too big, like nuclear war, what can I do, you know? Well, there is something you can do, because you can see your state legislature and make a difference. Okay, enough preaching on that. Uh, now we go into our issues and strategies panel. I need Jerry, I need Marty. Is Joe Levine here? I haven't met Joe Levine. Hi, Joe. Please come up here. Jonathan King is in the hospital, so he can't give his talk today. So we have one less presenter than we bargained for. <coughs> He's okay. It's like a thing that flares up and it's happened before. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, so without further ado, uh, I'm gonna ask John Rabbi to talk about uh, bird dogging, which he already began to do, and to go into a little bit more depth. I'm gonna ask Jerry Ross to talk about anti-war bills in Congress. I'm gonna ask Marty Nathan to talk about what's happening with Venezuela, and Joe Levine to talk about how we can campaign around Palestine. Seven minutes each, the rest of the time for discussion. Uh, we need a timekeeper. You can sit in the front row and, and sit there with your watch <coughs> and give an evil eye to the person you talk to. All right, we have a timekeeper, Martha. Okay, John, you're in. You're up. Okay, Martha, be sure to keep me honest, okay? All right, uh, back to bird dogging. Uh, here's the deal. The major thrust of our effort is to make issues concerning the, the arms race and militarism so visible that no presidential candidate can escape addressing those issues. Now, so far that's been a problem. I have either seen or met uh, eight presidential candidates. I've spoken with seven. Only one, Tulsi Gabbard, actually included references to militarism in the arms race in her stump speech. Kamala Harris didn't mention any of that stuff at all. You know, whatever her stance in the Senate may be. So that's, that's problem number one. Um, there's also the matter of money. And a lot of these folks have said good things about arms control, arms reduction, observance of treaties, so on and so forth. But when it comes to the money and appropriations, the question becomes, as you know, how they actually vote. So. It's a mixed bag. Let me give you some examples of where the priorities are. Last year, New Hampshire got just under 12 million bucks in federal aid to treat opioid addiction. It paid out 275 million to modernize nuclear weapons. Go figure, okay? 
You want the same for Massachusetts? Just multiply those numbers by five and you'll get the general idea. Anyway, uh, our presenting issue in the bird dog campaign is uh, the abandonment of first use of nuclear weapons. You know, that's part of the back to the brink package that I'm sure all of you are familiar with, and we're working on that too. Uh, at the same time, at the same time, as Joe Gerson has reminded us, there are fundamental issues that also require attention, uh, like the accelerating arms race amongst the United States, Russia, and China, and emerging technologies like hypersonic glide vehicles, for, for example. Uh, and uh, also our retreat from any one of a range of treaties that were designed to restrain the arms race or hopefully bring it to an end. Uh, I think you can figure out the rest. But anyway, we need you. Come to breakout se session. Uh, I'm going to be running something. We can design it according to your pleasure. Uh, but we would ha love to have some of you come up and help us bird dog candidates and make sure that nobody who runs for president can slip by without addressing issues around militarism which, as you know, spill over into racism, poverty, environmental destruction, exactly the sort of stuff that Dr. King warned us about half a century ago and which in large measure has been blithely ignored. Thanks very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, John. So I just grabbed a, a bunch of these from the table, and if you didn't get this, you can pass it around, and if you run out, there are more on the table. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give you a brief uh, summary of the bills in Congress directly related to nuclear disarmament, and that's really um, some very hopeful news. In the, in the face of all the bad things going on, withdrawing from treaties and and uh, this uh, terrible plan to, to uh, uh, increase our uh, nuclear arsenal. The fact that we have six bills in Congress, five of which are jointly both in the House and Senate, is really extraordinary. So I'm going to throw a lot of numbers at you. Most of the, them you can just ignore. The, the bills are listed uh, on the sheet I'm, hanging, uh, I'm uh, uh, sending around. Um, so first of all, we have uh, House Resolution 669 and Senate 200. This should sound familiar. This is the Markey Lew bill that has been in Congress now for a number of years. It's reintroduced again in uh, 2019, the Restricting First Use of Nuclear, Nuclear Weapons Act. And it removes presidential uh, first strike authority. It's very specifically uh, and uh, re would require congressional action for uh, any first use of nuclear weapons. It has 55 co-sponsors now. Last year it had 85, so we have some work to do. And there are only two in here in Massachusetts, McGovern and Clark, and last year we had five. So we need to do some work on that. <coughs> the, uh, uh, <coughs> the corollary in the Senate uh, is uh, uh, Senate 200 that has 13 co-sponsors that was introduced, of course, by Markey and is co-sponsored uh, by Warren. Um, so again, uh, uh, work to do, both of our Massachusetts senates, uh, senators, but a uh, long ways to go in the Senate. H.R. 921 and Senate 272, a uh, very important bill introduced by Adam Smith. Very, very simple, to establish the policy of the United States regarding no first use of nuclear weapons, and that's it, that's, that's the policy. There will be no first use. Uh, there is a Senate version introduced by our Senator Warren, uh, only one co-sponsor co there, not surprisingly, Senator Markey. And going back to the House, Adam Smith has 30 co-sponsors. Uh, he doesn't have uh, uh, the representative from my district, so I'm working on her. I don't understand. She's on the uh, um, Armed Services Committee uh, 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 with him. House Resolution 302, embracing the goals and provisions of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. We're going to hear, I'm sure, more about this this afternoon because um, uh, Representative um, McGovern is the, uh, has introduced it, an extraordinarily uh, brave, courageous bill. It's essentially the back from the brink bill. Uh, it, it calls for us to make um, 
uh, to embrace the goals and provisions of the nuclear ban treaty, and it has uh, uh, five major pieces to it, um, renouncing the option of first use, ending the president's sole authority to launch a nuclear strike, taking the nuclear weapons off first alert, canceling the plan to replace the nuclear arsenal, this $1.7 trillion a quote unquote modernization plan, and then finally actively to pursue a verifiable agreement among the nuclear states, and that's the ban. Uh, you want to make a comment? Okay, so why don't you tell me about that when I finish this? Okay, then we have H.R. 10, uh, 1086 and Senate 401 Hold the Line Act. It is an effort to prohibit the research, development, production of the Trident D5 low yield uh, nuclear warhead. And that's uh, introduced by uh, Ted Liu, has 30 sponsors, the Senate version introduced by Markey, with seven co-sponsors, including Warren. Uh, item uh, Bill 5 is the INF Treaty Compliance Act. Uh, Representative Gabbard introduced that, has co seven co-sponsors, and it had the uh, slightly uh, different language but the same focus in the Senate is uh, Jeff Merkley's bill, Prevention of the Arms Race of 2019. And finally, only in the Senate, about a very important forward-looking bill is the New START Policy Act of 2019 introduced by Se uh, Senator Bob Menendez of New Jersey. And that uh, establishes or requires reports from the um, Director of National Intelligence and the uh, Secretary of Defense on what would be the uh, consequences of our not renewing the New START uh, treaty. So it's a forward-looking bill, very important to support. And you want to add something? Yes, please. So those are all very exciting, and there's one more that, to my mind, is the most exciting of all, and it's just a few days old. Eleanor Holmes Norton of Washington, D.C. has a new bill that NuclearBand.us and Wilk and other organizations have worked very hard to make happen. And uh, that bill is, I'll take a look at the exact language. Um, it's HR 2419. It is called the Nuclear Weapons Abolition and Economic <coughs> Energy Conversion Act of 2019. It requires the US to sign and ratify an international agreement to, dis to disable and dismantle America's nuclear weapons, strictly control fissile material and radioactive waste, and use nuclear-free energy. The United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons is just such an agreement. The 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which is the focus of everything we do in our, in our neck of the woods, um, well, the, no, the organization, uh, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, won the Nobel Peace Prize for facilitating that treaty. And so this is putting, and that's the same treaty that's mentioned in the governance bill. He's calling for it to be embraced, which is wonderful. Uh, and Holmes Norton is calling it for an even stronger language to sign and ratify that bill. Um, so uh, we believe that nuclear abolition, you know, as long as there's even one of these things, no matter who uses them where, uh, or why, as long as there's even one nuclear weapon left on the planet, we are not safe. So we're going full blast for total nuclear abolition. We don't think it's unrealistic. Um, there are a lot of people who've been working on this for a long time, working on other approaches, and those are excellent. We're supporting all of it, and um, you know why not go for the whole thing too? While you're at it. Mm -hmm. What's the number of that? Book? Congress at all, and look at us now. This is incredible progress. 
So, it's happy news. All right, what's the number of that bill again? 2419, HR 2419. Okay, next up is uh, Marty Nathan. She's gonna update us on the fast moving situation in Venezuela, what we can do. Does that work? Push the red button and hold it. Can you hear? No. Press Give it to Oh, it was. I think it was on. Oh, I think it was on. Shut it off, did you? Here, switch, switch with me. Hand me the other one. Okay. All right. Hi. Um, I'm Marty Nathan. I'm from Northampton, from the Western Mass Venezuela Solidarity Coalition. I wanted to start out by um, tipping my hat if I had. To the, um, to the activists who are now, uh, who have taken over the Venezuela embassy in Washington, D.C. They've had water and electricity turned off. They include a couple of friends of ours from Western Mass. Not water. The district was on a call last night. Electricity, yes, water, they still have. Apparently today they turned off water. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would ask everybody in this room, even though it's Saturday, to call Markey and Warren and your congressional um, representative and ask for intervention on behalf of Congress. This is what is happening, it's illegal. This building is owned by um, the Venezuelan government and this is, was an outright attempt to usurp um, Venezuelan dominion over its embassies and co-dealers and their friends are holding down the floor literally right now. So please call and ask for congressional intervention. I am not sure exactly how much to talk about the history of Venezuela, but I think I'll give us a little bit because not everybody knows that much and, and it's sort of, and the media never tells us anything. I have studied the media for many a year and have never been so outraged as I have over its coverage of Venezuela, which has all reflected the, the Trump administration's approach to regime change and never once looked at what is happening inside the country itself. Um, Venezuela was an oligarchy, um, run by an oligarchy, um, it, has, it is sitting on the largest deposit of uh, reserve oil in the whole world. Uh, prior to 98, in 1998, there was extreme poverty with greater than 40% in extreme part poverty in 1996. Hugo Chavez was elected in 98, and his government, the Bolivar Farian Revolution, take, took over in 1999. And began steeply lowering poverty and illiteracy rates, bringing housing, food, and health care to millions of people. Um, it probably, that plus it's at taking over effective control of the oil industry, which is responsible for 85% of the country's income, provoked the United States from day one to oppose it. Uh, it used much of the proceeds of, of oil, unlike previous governments, to support the people in Venezuela. Um, there's been, uh, the United States has poured tens of millions and probably more, it is very hard to know, in backing the opposition. If the opposition is diverse, particularly now, and I'm not going to create a one-size-fits-all, but the main, uh, backing within the, the main source of opposition from the very beginning was coming from the upper classes in the Chamber of Commerce. There is now socialist opposition to Maduro, and, and that, I'm not gonna go there, it, it, it is true. But, on the, uh, but from the very beginning, the United States has been supporting the right wing elements within it through using, through the U.S. Agency for International Development, and the CIA-linked NGOs like the National Endowment of Democracy for Democracy, which I first heard of in Haiti uh, during the regime change there. 
Uh, the opposition stage a coup that lasted for three days in April 2002. The reason it only lasted for three days was because there was such an outpouring of support for Chavez, and there really wasn't much support for the opposition. So they left the presidential palace. Uh, there was another referendum that was to get rid of Chavez in 2004 that was beaten back too. Uh, Maduro was elected president of Venezuela after Chavez's death in 2013. He was re-elected in 2018, and I'll touch on that very briefly. Um, the, there were elections that, that the opposition and Trump uh, claimed were unfair, but actually were overseen by United Nations observers and found to be fair. The turnout was very low. Uh, most of the opposition, including the party of Juan Guaido, boycotted those elections and then said that they were unfair. Um, there have been claims of repression, we're sure they're probably true, by the Maduro government, including by Amnesty International. The context is a tense political and economic battle in a country that is extremely poor and where the stakes are very high. Um, there are also claims of financial mismanagement, so many of them probably valid, but once again, context. The steep dropping of oil prices in, uh, in 2009 and then again in 2014, which wiped out much of the, um, the wealth of Venezuela, um, and then followed by the economic sanctions that began in 2015 under the Obama government. Let's go to those uh, economic sanctions. Um, they have been ever tightening since 2015. They prevented the country from selling its oil to any of its North American and European trading partners or buying goods, including medicines and food. It's calculated that sanctions cost Venezuela $6 billion since October, August of 2017. There have resulted in massive inflation and shortages. Over 8 million Venezuelans cannot afford three meals a day. Protein has disappeared from many of their diets. Essential medicines are lacking. Uh, for some such medicines, uh, uh, only 20% of the quantity needed is available. Others have just disappeared from sight. Many Venezuelans suffering chronic disease have died, uh, particularly from HIV, AIDS, um, cancer, or hemophilia. And a recent study showed that 40,000 people have died due to the lack of medical care and food from the sanctions alone. <clears throat> then comes Juan Guaido. The economy has been destroyed by oil prices and economic sanctions. Juan Guaido is a right-wing National Assembly president. He has been associated with U.S. regime change agencies for over a decade. He was educated in the U.S. under the tutelage of, I don't get this name right even though I speak some Spanish, is the IMF Executive Director Luis Enrique Berris Betia. Uh, um, and he, he Guaido, uh, participated in deadly anti government protests in Venezuela in, in, I think it was 2006. He has only been a minor player in Venezuela. Uh, he's much better known in Washington. In 2015, he was elected to the National Assembly by 26% of the vote from his very poorly populated district. This was not a national election. He became president of the National Assembly through rotation, not through election. Uh, the political... Hey, excuse me while you're at time. Can you begin to wrap up? Sure. I, I'm sorry. Um, we had step in John Bolton and Elliot Abrams who back him and through a series, not just one attempted coup. The first was the provocation at the border after Guaido had, ele had elected himself president. The first was the uh, attempt to introduce food aid at the border. 
border, which was actually just a bit, an attempt to provoke, provoke Maduro to violence so that there could be an invasion. It didn't work. The second, as we know, happened just a couple of weeks ago in which he declared a coup and took over one part of the street in Caracas and then disappeared. They failed. There is not support for the right-wing part of the opposition, although, again, there is opposition. We in Western Mass Solid Venezuelan Solidarity took up, as soon as we saw uh, the Guaido declaring himself king or president, uh, we decided that we could not see one more U.S. intervention. We have come out opposed to military intervention and support the two paired uh, resolutions in Congress against military intervention. We also demand the ending of U.S. sanctions, which are collective punishment and therefore illegal, the end of U.S. diplomatic support for Guaido, the end of U.S. funding of the Venezuelan opposition, and finally the allowing of peaceful negotiations between Venezuela and the opposition. We are educating through forums. We are going to our, um, our to Markey and Warren's office and have not made a whole lot of um, progress there. But in fact, we did finally get our foot in the door when our wonderful uh, Congressman McGovern agreed not only to come to meet all of our demands, but also to hold hearings in Congress. It is something that, uh, again, about the economic sanctions and the effect that they are having on the people of Venezuela. It is something that all of us should get in, on board for, call Congressman McGovern's office, demand that he go through with this, even though he may not be your congressional representative, and also call Marky Warren and your congressional rep about what to protect the demonstrators that are in the DC Embassy. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Levine, um, representing <coughs> Western Mass Jewish Voice for Peace. And I guess I want to just pick up on what the uh, lady over there said about the brochures, Why Palestine Matters. So that's the theme of what I want to talk about, is why Palestine matters. So I wrote down a list, I don't know if I can get through it, but I thought of seven big issues that we all care about that somehow implicate Palestine. So the first one, of course, is just a straightforward human rights issue. Um, the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights, which is occupied, by the way, despite what Trump says, um, uh, has been going on for 52 years. But really, the occupation of Palestine has been going a lot longer than that. Um, in 1948, when the state of Israel was founded, over three quarters of the indigenous population of Palestine was uh, kicked out brutally and not allowed to come back in. This has been an ongoing disaster for Palestinians. And there are the people who in the United States almost never have been able to get a hearing. That's changing, but nevertheless. Um, so that's one thing. It's just a straightforward, clear human rights issue. If you care about people anywhere else in the world who are oppressed, you've got to care about Palestinians too. The second thing is, if you care about nuclear weapons, well, Israel is one of the most highly nuclear armed countries in the world. They won't say officially they have it, but everyone knows that. They have somewhere between two and three hundred warheads and missiles. They are a major, it's a small country, just less than 10 million people, but they are one of the major military powers in the world. And, um, and it has been a real problem that this whole issue, it's been a welly, this business about Iran wanting to develop a nuclear weapon, right? Uh, Iran and actually many Arab countries have been saying, let's have a nuclear free zone in the Middle East. The US will not allow that declaration. Why? Because they will not uh, force Israel to give up its nuclear weapons. So if you care about nuclear weapons, Israel and their, its arsenal is really right at the center of it. Do you care about police brutality, surveillance, mass incarceration? Well, here we go again. Um, Israel has a program of over 60 municipal police departments in this country have sent their police 
of people to be trained in Israel. Uh, and what they do is they learn how to, you know, Israel is a laboratory for surveillance and mass and population control techniques because of the occupation. Yeah. And they train our police forces. And, and they come back and then they treat our people like the occupied people in the West Bank. Um, Jewish Forces of Peace has a national campaign called End the Deadly Exchange. That's how we refer to this uh, cooperation between our uh, police forces. And North in Northampton, we were successful. We got the first time that a police chief had been invited to go on one of these programs to Israel for training and had agreed. We mounted a campaign in Northampton. We got them to say no. It's the first time it happened. Also, at the very same time, the Vermont State Police did come too. Uh, there were groups there. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, and then actually, another uh, issue, uh, there are legislative issues too, we'll talk about in the breakout session, but another thing that I think right now, speaking of the bird dogging candidates, mm -hmm. I can't think of any issue that could break apart the progressive wings of the Democratic Party or just the Democratic Party itself in the upcoming election more than this issue. Um, all we have to do is look and see what's been happening in England and then also in the United States. Um, the Labour Party in England under Jeremy Corbyn is being torn apart by a concerted effort, an alliance between the Israel lobby, the Israel Ministry of Strategic Affairs, by the way, which directs a lot of what goes on with the Israel lobby in both England and the United States, and then also those old guard in the Labour Party that want to keep the entrenched corporate power, you know, the um, Tony Blair wing of the party. And they together are using the charge of anti-Semitism as a cudgel against him for, um, and it's a way of destroying progressive politics. It's happening now in the United States. We have Elon Omar, everyone knows what happened with her, Rashida Tlaib, um, those two in particular, but others as well. They are being targeted, and it's partly an alliance, again, between the traditional Israel lobby and the old guard of the Democratic Party that does not want to see the Democratic Party turn genuinely progressive. They band together and say, ah, you see, progressives are anti-Semitic. And for many, many years, people who were involved in the Palestine Solidarity Movement were basically told to shut up. When it comes time for elections, shut up because we've got to get this person elected, and your issue is toxic. Well, it's just not going to work anymore. Progressives understand, as, as the woman said about intersectionality, you know, their chance from Ferguson to Palestine. The thing is, people aren't going to show up. We have members of Congress who are going to speak out. So the only thing is to just stand up and not allow this demonization that is going on. And the demonization, by the way, just last thing I want to mention is, uh, um, 27 states, I believe that's the right number, it's over half, but 27 states now have legislation on the books to punish people for supporting boycott and divestment of sanctions in Israel. Imagine that. It's a free speech issue, but 27 states, Massachusetts came very close. I was actually part of testimony in the legislature against that, and it could come up again in Massachusetts. The Senate has now passed a bill uh, which will um, uh, sanction people in some, it, it actually allows states to sanction people, right? It makes it easier for states to do it. This has got to be opposed. We have got to stop allowing this charge of anti-Semitism, and there's real anti-Semitism on the right. We have to stop allowing this charge to be used to silence uh, people, because for one thing, we're not going to be silent anymore. So you've got to deal with us. <laughs> and the best way is to just say, look, we understand. This is just the same issue we're fighting in Venezuela, the same issue we're fighting in Washington, the same issue we're fighting in Ferguson. And we just can't allow ourselves to be silenced anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Just to real briefly try to channel to what Jonathan King was going to say. The point is that our, the military budget has always been a huge portion of our nation's wealth, but under the Trump administration, it's grown even more rapidly than before. And uh, the proposed numbers are just horrifying. And the impact to domestic services is real. 
uh, the, the impact to education and health care and transportation. And do you really want to pay for the Green New Deal? Do you really want to pay for Medicare for all? All the progressive priorities, or even all the basic human needs priorities that we've kind of been accustomed to in the past, are going to be gutted by this military buildup. So there's a potential coalition between the peace movement and the social, uh, all the social movements. Uh, we have to support them, they have to support us, and make common cause on the economic front. Uh, so that in brief is uh, the, the paying on budget message. Um, Poor People's Campaign, uh, I'm not sure if I remember to put them out on the table, brought an op-ed by William Barber making this point also. And the Poor People's Campaign is to introduce their new moral budget in June at their conference in Washington. Um, which will, again, show what a real uh, people's budget would look like in this country. So now it's your turn. Uh, who has something to say in response to what you've heard, or who wants to add something that you didn't hear? Jan. I'd like to just remind people that, um, based on what Joe just said, just think, Israel is the size of New Jersey. Imagine New Jersey having the same size I'd just like to add uh, for the Venezuela that, that um, our group has been uh, putting together a petition with five points. It's over on the table here um, that we're going to be presenting to Marky and Warren and Neil and um, McGovern. If your representatives are uh, McGovern or um, Neil, that's okay. You can still sign it because we're bringing this petition to all four. Um, which we'll be asking for the, um, the points of let go of sanctions, etc. Um, the uh, I'm from the other group, the Boston area Venezuela Solidarity Committee, and we've been uh, having visits with a few members of the of our uh, congressional delegation the same kind of activities that the Western Mass Group is undertaking. And so uh, uh, we'd be interested in uh, getting contact information from any of you uh, outside uh, of the, uh, well, just from any of you who are not aware of whether your rep has been visited or not visited, or you might be interested in the nuclear issues. Uh -huh. We're at an incredibly dangerous spot right now in Korea with the breakdown of the negotiations between Trump and King, Kim Jong-un and uh, in Vietnam. Uh, Bolton uh, is in charge of his policy. He's in charge of the negotiations in Vietnam breaking down. Bolton wants war. He wants regime change in North Korea. Uh, and they are planning for that. If, these, if there's not a new round of negotiations, put the reconciliation process back on track, we're right back to the fire and fury um, threats of Trump, which could materialize by the end of the year. So it's just something we really have to keep our eye on as, as much as these immediate uh, situations face us right now. This question is for our New Hampshire friend, John. Sure. I saw that Code Pink did uh, rankings of the presidential candidates on issues of war and peace and the militarism. And they ranked Bernie Sanders number one, Tulsi Gabbard number two, Elizabeth Warren number three. Is that consistent with what you've seen and heard in your experience on the ground? That's a good question. Uh, Mike, does it work? Are we alive? Okay. Um, there's some contradictions. Um, according to the peace action testimony, Sanders is on top of the heat when it comes to his voting record. Warren's close behind. Um, now, that's up against my own experience. You know, the, the, the kicker is not only 
what they say about policy and where they voted on policy issues. It's also where they voted on, uh, on appropriations. You know, Warren's pretty good when it comes to uh, nuclear arms control, no first use, things like that. Uh, her voting record in appropriations? I don't know. You know? Uh, Tulsi's quite frank and open. And as I said before, she's the only one who's come out. You know, she's been, in terms of my personal contact with her, right at the top of the list. But then again, most of the time, she votes the money that the Pentagon wants. So there's that contradiction, which uh, leads me to keep emphasizing uh, that we have to keep pressing on this issue and make it such that nobody running for president can escape it. Uh, of all the people, aside from um, Gabbard, that I interviewed so far, the one that appeared the most promising was Cory Booker. Now, I've got something in common. I grew up in the same county he did. I attended the same college he did. You know, so I'm doing that number on him. He's saying, no way! Uh, and uh, I said, okay, now I've got some business to transact. Will you drop first use? Yes. Uh, will you take the weapons off entry? Yes. Will you take seriously our obligations uh, to negotiate disarmament? Not arms control, not arms reduction. They're different because there's an underlying premise. You know, if we stop with arms reduction and arms control, this says, these little suckers are manageable. So we got a problem there. Well, continuing the court. Uh, will you drop the nuclear weapons modernization program? Yes. You bring back INN? Yes. You know, all the way down the line. And he, and he said it without, without hesitation. His votes on uh, appropriations are somewhat different. I had a conversation with, uh, uh, with Gillibrand. She seemed pretty favorable, uh, kind of up and down. Uh, she looked at me and said, your questions are sophisticated. Can you give me your email? Uh, and left it more or, uh, more or less at that. Uh, John Delaney, relatively obscure, but he was the first one I met, uh, was pretty good up and down the line. Almost as good as Booker, when I asked him on all these issues and back, uh, back from the brink. Andrew Yang, very, very funny. Very subtle guy, I'll tell you what. Go on his website, look up his statement on nuclear armament, and he says no single person uh, should have the power to launch nuclear weapons. That's the first sentence of the statement. So far, so good, right? Then he said, says, the vice president, or in the vice president's absence, the White House chief of staff should verify a presidential order. Uh, uh, in other words, so, uh, so here I am with Yang at a fraternity house at Dartmouth. Got this? Two days ago. And um, so I say, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That means that I could trot up to the vice president and say, did the president really say that? And the vice president would say, yeah, we still need sole authority to launch nuclear weapons in the president's hands, doesn't it? And I said, what about Congress? And uh, that pretty well sank him, but it was kind of interesting to watch the Dartmouth kids in the crowd. As I asked those questions, I brought up the, uh, the subject, because you could see the fear on their faces. And I want to underscore something else. And this gets back to Joe's point, ongoing point about fundamentals. The people who are the direct survivors of nuclear weapons in war or of atmospheric testing are aging and dying out. We have been nearly three quarters of a century under nuclear armament. If the modernization program goes through, that's a century, folks. So what lies before us? The possibility of permanent institutionalization of nuclear armament and people getting comfortable with those things. So that's the best answer I can give you on 
where these people uh, stand. So, uh, Beto O'Rourke was pretty good on this, but I would say so far, based on what I've read and what I've seen, uh, uh, Sanders, Warren, and Gabbard are on the top of the list. Okay, anyone else? I have a question. John, how do we sign up? That sounds like fun. Oh, great. All right. You're drafted. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, I've got a sign-up sheet. All you have to do is put your contact information, your names, down in the uh, sign-up sheet. Print legibly, please. I'll get it up to um, New Hampshire Peace Action, and we'll be in touch with you. I can't find it over here on the table. That's so all right. I've got it with me. Okay, right in front of me. See John if you'd like to join the, the third time. Yeah, yeah. We've got sign-up sheets. Can you just link the three Sure. Um, depending on how you word it, it is, the, uh, it is the art of encountering, you could say encounter, you could say pester, uh, candidates for office with pointed questions about issues of, about concern asked in such a way that they can't escape them. You know, that's the whole point. Now, there are two targets of such questioning. One target is the candidate himself or herself. Now, that's pretty self-evident. But the other target is the audience that's gathered in the room. So there are various ways you can place yourself in the room, although this year uh, there have been some new tricks added to candidate appearances in New Hampshire, uh, which were different from 2016. One, particularly in large venues. By the way, don't go to Dartmouth for any of these town halls. It's a terrible place to do bird dogging. Uh, Anyway, uh, one of the new tricks is that uh, the campaign ads pass out raffle tickets to ask questions. I've never encountered that before this year, though I'm relatively new to this process. I started only in 2016, after I moved to New Hampshire from Jersey. Uh, so, you know, that's one thing. Uh, but that's basically what bird dogging is. Uh, no, you can do that anywhere. Uh, but the point is, we're looking for folk to come up to New Hampshire. We've got nine months to go for, from the, here now to the primary. Now, I'd like the birth of this baby, please. And uh, so uh, do come, because if you do this in New Hampshire, it's practice for Massachusetts when the moment arrives. I hope that clarifies things somewhat. Obviously, the candidates spend a lot more time in New Hampshire than they do in Massachusetts. We do sometimes get them through here. Um, but that's why New Hampshire is so focused. It's such a great opportunity for this. Um, yes? Could I, I, I think that Mike, I was waiting for a question. Okay. Sure. Okay, I'm yeah. in there. Just because it's true that the trust proposal greatly increases the category of standing known as Overseas Contingency Operations, or OCO. But that actually, even though that was originally designed as a war budget at the time of the Iraq and Afghanistan uh, wars during the Obama presidency, 09 and 10, uh, the Pentagon now uses that for whatever they want. So it's simply a budget gimmick. Uh, there, there is a, a bargain in Congress 
uh, Budget Control Act is still in effect, that domestic and, and military spending have to be kept in step. If they want to increase military spending, they also increase domestic spending. But this OCO category is exempt from that bargain. So simply by calling them spending OCO, they overseas, overseas contingency, contingency operations. operations. So in other words, that money is not really always spent on, on current wars. Okay. It may be, it may not be. So the number to look at is the overall amount of military spending. That's my piece. Uh, there was a question over here. Congress, Jim McGovern, 
who is a representative from this part of Massachusetts. He's the son of Worcester. And we've asked him to speak about a few different things today. Above all, about the what's happening in Congress with the peace agenda, the progressive agenda. Um, what are the prospects for cutting the military budget? And above all, for cutting the nuclear weapons budget? Just happened to see an item sitting here today from Bloomberg News that the Progressive Caucus is balking at approving the, what is it, uh, $735 billion military proposal? Why would they balk at that? Um, on the Yemen and Saudi situation, we had a huge victory when both houses of Congress passed a bill to end uh, U.S. military forces involvement in the Yemen war. Uh, but unfortunately, Trump vetoed that bill and uh, Congress wasn't able to override it. The next agenda item to end the Saudi war is Jim's bill. Is it 643, I believe, which, well, I'll just let him tell you about it. And um, then we are beating war drums on Venezuela. We're beating war drums on Iran. Um, the situation with Korea is extremely dangerous with the breakdown in the talks there. So we have a series of trouble spots where the U.S. Uh, administration is taking an aggressive posture. And we'd love to hear Jim McGovern's thoughts about how we can tackle all of that. And more generally, how can we make some headway in the current political situation? So without further ado, Jim McGovern. <laughs> 